Tonight, the book of Exodus, chapter 1. As you're turning to Exodus, chapter 1, I ask you to pray with me tonight. Exodus, chapter 1. And if, if you find that, let's bow together with, together with prayer. Father, we come to you acknowledging that you are God and that you are sovereign and that you keep all of your promises. And Lord, we acknowledge God also that we know nothing about you except what we find in your word. We have no right to think of you as any other than how you've revealed yourself. Father, we thank you for that promise because uh, we have your word in our language and we can know you. We can know who you really are and what you're really like. And we thank you that we have had the gospel in this country for so many years, that we've had a knowledge of Jesus Christ for so long. And I pray for those nations of the world that have never heard the name of Christ, not one time, that you would send workers to them, many, many workers to them, Father. I pray that you would bless Fountainhead Baptist Church and uh, help us to be enlightened as we look to your word. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray. Bless us tonight, Father, as only you can. May you receive all the glory for what is said and done this evening. And we acknowledge you are sovereign over all things, great and small. We thank you and we give you praise. And we ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Now verse 1. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were seventy in number. But Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died, and all his brothers in all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful, and increased greatly, and multiplied, and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Seventy Israelites began in Egypt. And we learn from the book of Genesis why the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, were in Egypt in the first place. Joseph was sold there to slavery. He was brought up in Pharaoh's court. He was raised up by God Himself to be a deliverer because here comes the famine. And the famine was great in all the land. And in order to get grain, in order to get food and survive, they had to go to Egypt to purchase grain. They had a great reunion with Joseph, and Joseph said, why don't you all stay here? I'll give you the best of Egypt. I'll give you a great place to live. You all just stay here and settle. And that's what they did. Joseph died, and that whole generation passed away. But those 70 people, those 70 people, those sons of uh, Jacob, they exceedingly became mighty. And it says in verse 7, they were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied. I hope that sounds familiar to you from the previous book of the Old Testament. In Genesis, twice God said to the, the people on earth, be fruitful and multiply. I love that verse. It might be my life verse. I don't know. Be fruitful and and multiply. Why is that? Because God's blessing is upon multiplication of the godly line. Whenever there's barrenness, that's the curse of God. But fruitfulness is the blessing of God. So, so Israel is exceedingly, exceedingly blessed. How do we know? They grew enormous in number. And the land was filled with them. They became a new ethnic group in Israel within 270 some years. 
And now we come to verse 8. Now, years and years and years later, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Hear the foreshadowing there? The foreshadowing there? He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or shrewdly with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war they will also join themselves to those who hate us, and fight against us, and depart from the land. So ironic, right? Pharaoh is afraid they're going to leave. So he does something to try to get them not to do any of these things that he fears. Seems like pharaohs are all the same. They fear something, and they do something about it, and it ends up happening just as they feared. So, verse 11, they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiply, and the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. So, Pharaoh, in trying to get rid of them, in trying to weaken them, puts heavy labor upon them, which has the opposite effect. You know, it was common sense to try to get them to work harder. He thought they would not multiply, but they did. Something about that, that affliction caused them to multiply all the more. And verse 13, the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and in all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. Now what did Israel do wrong? Absolutely nothing. They did what God had commanded mankind to do, in fact. And they just happened to find themselves within Egypt under a very evil king. May I suggest that there's something going on here that's much bigger than human history? Let me remind you of something that God said way back in Genesis 3 about the struggle between good and evil. Genesis 3.15, remember? God is speaking to the serpent, and He says this, Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. What I want to focus on is that enmity. Not just between serpent and woman, but between the descendants of the woman, the children of Israel, and the descendants of the serpent. You see, Pharaoh is being Satan's own pawn right here in the second book of the Bible in Exodus. This is the struggle between God's people and the evil world. Okay? This is a cosmic, spiritual battle. And Satan is trying to cut off the children of God and to keep their blessing from them and to make their lives miserable, to keep them from multiplying, to keep them from blessed, being blessed by God. But God has another plan. God has another plan. Again, Genesis 15... Let me remind you of what was predicted about this. Genesis 15, verse 13. Look carefully at Genesis 15, 13. We have to remember that everything God says is true. God cannot lie. It is absolutely contrary to His character. Therefore, whatever God says, whether it seems like good news or bad news, is going to happen. It's true. Look at Genesis 15, 13. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, 
Where's that? Egypt. Where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. It's unthinkable, isn't it? How long is 400 years? Well, in 1612, we weren't even a nation. We wouldn't be a nation for another 150 some years. We were still a British colony, right? America had just been discovered 400 years ago from right now. That's a long time, folks. That's a long time. That's a lot of suffering. But God said it had to be that way for a purpose. In verse 15, again, the struggle between God and Satan played out in human drama. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shepra, and the other was named Hua. I want to pause there a minute this, because this is absolutely ironic. God is making absolute sure that the children of Israel, in reading this account, would understand something. The king of Egypt is supposed to be the mightiest ruler on earth. Remember that from the story of Joseph? There is no world power that is supposed to be greater than the king of Egypt. In verse 15, this mighty, highfalutin king of Egypt doesn't even have a name. But who does? Two Hebrew midwives. They're women. Let me remind you, this is way before even the law being given. Women did not have honor or status in society as they do now. God chose to name Shipra and Pua and left the king of Egypt unnamed. In his eternal word, we are going to know these ladies' names for all eternity and we are going to talk about how this king of Egypt was nothing. Tipped on the scales and, and measured as fine dust in comparison to these Hebrew women. In verse 16, he said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. If it is a daughter, then she shall live. That ought to be quite clear who the king of Egypt is serving in a cosmic sense. He's not becoming, he's not acting as the servant of God in this story, is he? He's the pawn of Satan. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we have the battle between the people of God and the enemies of God, this Egypt, this Pharaoh. Now look at verse 17. But the midwives fear God. And they did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. What does Scripture say their action was, good or evil? Scripture says it was good because it was honoring to God. This is a principle that we find all throughout the Bible. You find it in, uh, even up to Revelation chapter 13. That is this. When the powers that be go above the law of God and the will of God, we have no reason to have to obey those powers. If government mandates that we kill every firstborn child in the house, we have no obligation to obey the government. They have crossed the line past what God intended for them. And that's what's going on here. The midwives, it says, fear God. They disobeyed Pharaoh because they feared God. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know it already, the time is coming in the United States of America where standing for biblical truth and honoring God is going to have to mean you disobey the government. Even recently, a Canadian pastor for preaching that homosexuality is a sin landed up in jail. It's coming. It's coming. In fact, it's here. We have to decide already, right now, in this safe place, if we're going to obey God or man. God or man. The midwives feared God. The king of Egypt, verse 18, called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? Now they could have died there like his hand. 
The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. And verse 20, So God was good to the midwives. And, as if to say, part of that goodness, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. The multiplication of God's people is a blessing of God. It's a blessing of God. God wants His people to multiply. Physically and spiritually. Okay? Now people have asked, well, wait a minute, didn't these midwives lie? Didn't they tell a lie? Is, is God commending them for telling a lie? Well, first of all, the Lord commends them for their obedience to Him. Second of all, we're not told that they lied. I mean, this obviously was the way it was. You know, the Hebrew women are strong and vigorous. And it's kind of a slap in the face to the Egyptian nation. They're not like the Egyptian women. These are hosses, you know. These are strong women. They don't need any, they don't need no stinking midwife, you know. They don't need that. They got it all under control. Why? Because God blessed. God blessed. It reminds me of Nathaniel. He was born before the midwife came. Boy, you're awesome. God's blessed. So God was good to the midwives. Verse 21 says why? Because the midwives feared God. Feared God. He established households for them. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, again, acting as the spokesman for Satan himself, every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. God is all about preserving and saving lives. Satan is all about destroying and harming lives. So, you tell me, is all of this push toward more abortions something that is from God Himself or from the enemy? It ought to be clear knowing who God is. God says, do not murder. So, if a society says, okay, it's not God that's wrong, it's the society that's wrong. Keep that in mind. God loves, preserves, and saves lives. Satan wants to destroy them. So every firstborn son, every son, they are told, you must cast it into the Nile. You must kill this child. Pharaoh is going crazy in his sinfulness. He is so afraid that the men are going to rise up against Egypt and take over. He's just a maniac. He's insane. All he can think to do is to kill innocent children. This is not a man working under the direction of God. It's a man working under the direction of Satan. Chapter 2, verse 1. Not the end of the story. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. Now pause there for a moment. They've gone from children of Levi to house of Levi. You see the difference? They've gone from the sons of Judah, for example, to the tribe of Judah. Israel is growing mighty under the blessing of God. And the children of Israel, in reading this story later, knew very well that the, the tribe of Levi is where all the priests come from. And so they know who this man is. This is their national hero, folks. They know their national hero's lineage. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. Once again, defying the command of the Pharaoh, but honoring God in this act. Verse 3, But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Well, that sounds awful familiar. Something coated with tar and pitch? What does that sound like to you? Well, would you believe that the word basket in verse 3 
And the word ark, back in Genesis 5, is the same word. You think God is trying to tell us something? That there's a new deliverer that has come onto the scene? That there is a new vessel of salvation that's about to take part here for the children of Israel? And what I think is so amazing here is that his mother threw him in the Nile. She just put a basket between him and the water. She still did put him in the Nile. And the Nile was a symbol of death. The irony is so amazing in so many different levels. The Nile was a symbol of death. <coughs> death, killing the, the children, the, the sons. The Nile would be turning blood red from all the bloodshed. That would happen later in a different way. But she could hide him no longer. She placed her child in the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him, looking on at a distance. And then, oh my goodness, what a coincidence. Verse 5, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile with her maidens walking along the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. What another coincidence, huh? Do you think God knows what He's doing? Not only did she get to raise her own child under the education and richness of Egypt, but she got paid for it too. That's cool, isn't it? That's just cool. God is amazing. God is amazing. Verse 9 Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. What a day that was for her, right? What a day. She released her son. His life was spared. She got her son back, and she got a new job all in one day. Isn't that great? God has a purpose for this boy. God has a very special purpose for this child. And then verse 10. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses. And said, because I drew him out of the water. That's a play on words. She named him Hebrew Moshe, because I Masha him out of the water. I drew him up out of the water. So Moses, we all know Moses. Jump ahead a little bit. Moses grows. He, uh, he identifies with his people. The book of Hebrews says that he did this on purpose. He identifies with his Hebrew that's being mistreated by an Egyptian. He kills the Egyptian and hides him in the sand. But he's found out. And so Moses is on the run. Pharaoh himself is after Moses. Once again, Satan is after the people of God, right? Even Revelation 14, 15, the dragon in the wilderness wants to devour the child. It is the same old story from front to back. Satan wants to kill and destroy God's people and God's work. So, Moses flees out of Egypt. He actually gets away from Pharaoh. He finds some of his relatives. He establishes a new home. He gets married. He has children. And he's 40 years old. When we come to Exodus 2.23, Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. And so God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, 
Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the children of Israel, and God took notice of them. God did not forget His people. God cannot forget His people. And so we end Genesis with four truths that are going to continue right into Exodus. Number one, God's servants come and go, but God's promise endures strongly, even forever. You know, God's servants come and go, but God's promise stays the same. That's why, for example, it's very important that the minister of the Word of God simply speaks what God says and doesn't rely on their personality to lead the church. Because God's promises are always the same, but God's servants come and go, right? God's promises endure forever. Secondly, God is absolutely, meticulously, and graciously sovereign. Look at how Moses was reunited with his mother. Look at how Moses grew up with the best education in all the land of Egypt. God was preparing a leader there in Pharaoh's household. God was preparing a strong man who could take advantage of the world's wisdom as well as the relationship with God he would enjoy and lead those people out of Egypt. Number three, God has a purpose for Israel's suffering and ours also. The people of, did the people of God ever suffer? Oh yes. Oh yes. The story of the Jewish people is a story of suffering for thousands and thousands of years. Even to this day. But God does not allow us to go through suffering for no reason at all. There is always a purpose. There is always a great purpose for it. And God, fourthly, God cannot and will not forget His people. He promised it. That means that Israel has a future, not in Egypt, but the Promised Land. They cannot stay in Egypt. They've got to get out. Even though <coughs> Genesis ends with them in Egypt, and Exodus starts with them in Egypt, that is not the end of the story. They make it out. So God is making a people for Himself for His purposes. How I could not stress it enough. We can trust God. We can trust God. Even when we can't see. You know the valley of the shadow of death? That's a dark place. That's a dark place. And you know Psalm 23, don't you? How in the world do the sheep get in the valley of the shadow of death anyway in the first place? Because the Lord is the shepherd. He's taking us through it. He's the leader. He's the boss. He's the shepherd. He knows what he's doing. There's an old song by Wayne Watson that says, I'd rather walk in the dark with Jesus than be in the light on my own. I hope that's your testimony today. People, you can trust him. Even when we don't know what we're doing, he does. And he sees the big picture. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank You for Your promises. Thank You for Your goodness. Thank You for Your grace.